Tonight, we're in Stirling, the setting for past battles and present political conflicts. This constituency has swung from Labour to the SNP, to the Conservatives, to the SNP in the last four general elections. So what matters most to people who live here right now? Let's find out. Welcome to Debate Night. Debate Night is the only show in Scotland where you get the chance to put your questions directly to the people in power, answering them on our panel this evening. The leader of Scottish Labour and MSP for Glasgow, Anna Sarwa. Anna succeeded his father as MP for Glasgow Central before being elected to Holyrood eight years ago and became Scottish party leader in 2021. He believes the forthcoming election is the most important for a generation. Liz Lloyd was former Chief of Staff and Strategic Advisor to Nicola Sturgeon. Born in Newcastle, Liz moved to Edinburgh as a student before joining the SNP as a special advisor 20 years ago. She left the front line of politics last year and now works for the political risk consultancy Flint Global and sits on a new advisory board to tackle child poverty. From the Scottish Conservatives, the MSP for Dumfrieshire, Oliver Mundell, former party spokesperson for education and skills. He was elected to Holyrood eight years ago. Oliver voted to leave the EU and was one of nine Conservative MSPs who backed Liz Truss for the leadership. Also with us, comedian, actor and writer Karen Dunbar, a regular on Chewing the Fat. She's also had a string of TV and stage roles. And during lockdown, she launched a social enterprise offering rap workshops for community groups around Glasgow. And finally, from the SNP, the MP for Ockel in South Perthshire, John Nicholson, a former journalist and broadcaster. John is the party spokesperson for culture, media and sport. Please welcome them all to Debate Night. <laughs> And welcome also to our studio audience here in Stirling. It's great to be back with you here. And you can join in the discussion wherever you are in Scotland. BBC DN is the hashtag you need right now on social media. Give us a follow at BBC Debate Night. And our podcast of the show will be available for you to download straight after this broadcast. We've got a lot to get through tonight, so let's get started. Our first question of the night comes from Andrew Massey. Andrew, good evening. Good evening. Do the panel think it is acceptable for Hamza Youssef to call on members to make history by making Scotland Tory free? Thank you. And I drew these were comments from the First Minister at an SNP gathering in Perth at the weekend. What do you think, Andrew? I think if I said something like that in my workplace, I would probably get a disciplinary action. So, no. Uh, John Nicholson, our audience tonight, as always, representative of Scotland, Conservatives in the room, alongside Conservative supporters in the room, alongside other parties as well. Um, this language, is it acceptable? Oh, I think there's been a bit of faux outrage about this, really. I mean, politicians use language, don't they, when they're talking about other parties. It's not always terribly complimentary. I'm, I'm sure I've said things that are not always as polite as they should be about um, Oliver's party. Um, and uh, it, it's part of the dialogue of politics. But I he's mean, the First Minister. Pete Wishart said, uh, I wouldn't be using that phrase, Tory Free Scotland. Would you use it? Well, I, I don't know. Um, I, can't, I don't want to be a hypocrite, because I might have said it in the past, and I just don't remember. I mean, I certainly heard Annis um, give a very fiery, rousing, passionate speech at his party conference where he said something pretty, liked it. pretty close uh, to that, if not those exact words. So, and I've, I've also, I've read plenty of tweets from, on social media from Conservatives saying things that are really pretty ripe about SNP <laughs> politicians. So it's one of those little faux outrage stories that is whipped, out by the, whipped up by the press. I don't think it will last very long as a story, but the important point of which you're making, of course, is it's beholden on all of us, I think, to be as courteous as possible in politics and to disagree agreeably. The public like it, and it makes for much better uh, quality debate, do, I think. Do the public like it? I wonder. We'll find out from our audience tonight. Just to be clear, he courtesy, wasn't just, The public like courtesy. He I wasn't think. just talking about politicians. He said, if we are to truly make Scotland Tory free, we need to reject not just Tory politicians, but Tory ideas and Tory values as well. Oliver Mundell, 22,000 people voted for you in your constituency. How do you feel about this? Well, I'm, I'm more interested, Stephen, in the fact that the First Minister is going to fail. This is a man who failed when he said he would get the trains to run on time. 
who failed to get NHS waiting times down, uh, who took our uh, police service to breaking point, he set himself a bar going into this general election where he's going to fail. Um, you know, I'm confident uh, from my own uh, activity out knocking on doors, speaking to people, that people in Scotland get it. You know, whichever part of Scotland they live in, they get it. If they like the SNP and what the SNP have to offer, they're voting for them. And if they don't like them, they're looking to see who else they can vote so, for. So and in many, I mean, just, in many John parts... Wright, is this just a storm in a key, teacup? You're not bothered I don't think about it's a storm. Language. I don't think it's a storm in a teacup. You know, I, I think it's an odd approach. I think it's something that someone does when they're desperate, when they've got nothing better to say, and when they're running scared because they realise that voters across Scotland are not fools. They're waking up to what 17 years of SNP government has been like. They see a man uh, in the First Minister's office uh, who is not on top of his job. Yes, he might be a nice... Uh, guy, but he is n not on top of his job. You support a um, trust, of course. So and, and, just, she's, and she's out just, of her just to and, put she's, that in context. and she's out of her job. Yeah. If politicians you don't, thought she was the ideal pol candidate. To be I did not minister. think she was the ideal candidate. Uh, that is not true. Oh, she was second um, best. No, I think uh, if it had been up to me, I'm, I'm not an enthusiast. Maybe we'll come on to this later uh, for changing prime minister. I'd far rather have seen. Uh, David Cameron or Theresa May still right, in well, 10 Downing Street, but that's not how things have played out. Let's stick to that's the question. That's not how things it. have played let's out. Let's stick to the question, which was, uh, was Hamza Yusuf right to call uh, for Scotland to be made Tory-free? Man in the back row, up there. I think what the electorate want to hear is actually what are politicians going to do for local people? So Douglas Ross recently has said, if you're in favour of a pro-UK person, you should vote the Conservatives, the only route to get rid of the SNP. I'm fed up with getting leaflets through my door that tell me why you shouldn't vote for somebody else. Why shouldn't we vote for you? Mm. That's what the electorate want to hear. Liz, Liz Lloyd, when you were advisor to uh, Nicola Sturge in 2022, she <laughs> said, I detest the Tories. Did you write that line for her? Um, I didn't. Uh, she did an interview and said that. Um, and I probably wouldn't have put forward the line that Hamza used this week but not because politics isn't a back and forth and politics isn't robust. I don't think the Tory-free language that Hamza used in that context where he's talking about the general election, he's talking about voting for MPs, I don't think it offends in the way that the Tories and some of the right-wing press have tried to say it offends. I think that's, that is what John said, it's faux outrage, it's been cooked so up. So why wouldn't you have used it? I wouldn't have used it because it's kind of what Man at the Back said. I don't think it's the right political approach right now. I think what people want to hear is a bit of substance. They want to hear how SNP MPs, if you're coming from the SNP perspective, are going to make the next government, a Labour government probably, better. How they're not going to let them off the hook, what they're going to do for Scotland. And this, you know, back and forth of who's worse than each other, it's not taking politics anywhere. On the language point, though, I think it's interesting that Oliver didn't address the language point because... This is faux outrage. When we have people talking about shooting MPs, when we have racism and misogyny in our politics, that is right when we're outraged about that. And if we start getting outraged about this kind of stuff that is just cooked up, we undermine it when it is really serious and when we really should be outraged and when we really need a prime minister to be willing to call out racism when it comes from one of his donors. Yeah, and he has done that. He's done that. It takes uh, time. Anna Sarwar, do you want to make Scotland Tory free? Look, I, I think it's really important to separate people from party and individual politicians and government. Because I think one of the... And actually, I think we saw a lot of this uh, around the independence referendum and around the Brexit referendum, regardless of what side anyone took in those two referendums, where a narrative kind of built up that somehow certain people were loyal to their country, certain people were not, certain people loved their country, certain people didn't, certain people had a right to express their views, certain people didn't. Let's be really clear, every single person in this room, regardless of their political affiliation, every single person across the country, regardless of their political affiliation, regardless of how they voted in the past, regardless of which political party they might identify with, all love Scotland, all wanted to succeed, all has an equal stake in the future of our country. We might just disagree on how we get there. Scottish Labour Conference, and, and you think, said the sooner and, we get rid of this yes, entire shower of Tories, yes, the better. What's and, the difference? And I, and I stand by that because the point I'm making there is let's separate the people from the party and the politicians because it's the rule of politics that you only win an election having lost an election if you persuade people who didn't vote for you last time to vote for you next time. So you've got to respect those uh, people and, and the views they take. I would make a different point on top of that in terms of party. I think if you look at what's happened over the last 14 years, forget the last 14 years, let's look at what's happened in the last two weeks. 
Two weeks ago, you had a deputy chairman, a former deputy chairman of the Conservative Party, who had made clearly Islamophobic and racist comments, having been empowered by Rishi Sunak, jumping to the Reform Party. Last week, you had Frank Hester, who had given a £10 million donation to the Conservative Party, making misogynistic, racist comments, inciting hatred against politi a politician when two MPs have been murdered in recent years. You have this week the Rwanda bill going back to this parliament again, a horrific policy where they're spending £2 million per head if you think about planes going off to Rwanda in terms of taking asylum seekers elsewhere. I think in that context, I think many people who might even view themselves as Conservatives, who might have voted Conservative in the past, will look at this government and think it's lost its way, has, will think it's gone to the extremes, and will think they, needed to be, they need to be booted out of office. Right. Well, I will stand by saying we need to get rid of this rotten Tory government, but we have to separate people from parties. Let's find out uh, by listening to our audience. Lady in the back row. Yeah, as a member of public, I am sick and tired of listening to you all bully each other, whether it be in the House of Commons or whatever. As a, a member of public, we want to know what you're going to do for us. Stop the bitching and the fighting and concentrate on our lives because it's our lives you're affecting. Does the language matter to you, the yes, language it does. that you hear? Yes, it does. It does not have a place. You respect each other, respect each other's views, regardless of your party. I'm, I'm not a Tory supporter. I'm not going to say what I, who I support. I support facts, figures and the truth. And right now, it's a mess. OK, thank you. <laughs> Gentlemen down here. Yes, on you go. Uh, I do disagree. I don't think it's for outrage. I think there's a very good basis for people who vote Tory to be outraged with what's being said. It's a fact that on the first day the First Minister was in office, he said he was going to be a First Minister for all of Scotland. That's what he tweeted. Here we are a year later and he's standing there telling us that he makes no apologies whatsoever for the comments that he's made. I find that grossly offensive. Right, John Nicholson, speak to that man and tell him why he's wrong. <coughs> well, if you're genuinely offended and you say you are, then I, of course, absolutely accept that you are offended. But I do really uh, agree very much that if, if, we, if, we, have a, if we have a range of offence. If you get that offended by that comment, where do you go when someone uses racist language? Because we've heard a lot uh, about this awful Islamophobic uh, line that uh, that has been used that's by the. That's just deflecting. By, off, by this, that's deflecting off. No, what I've he's agreed. Talking I've agreed. If he's offended, he's offended. But I, I really think it's very important to reserve the kind of intensity of offence for some of the really nasty comments. And in particular, you know the way we keep hearing that this donor and how he's apologised to Dan Abbott? He hasn't apologised. We're being gaslit about this. What he said was that he was rude to Dan Abbott. He has not apologised for being racist. So do you want to, to apologise to this gentleman? Tells us that do he you has. want to apologise to this gentleman if he is offended this evening? Listen, I'm not going to go around apologising to individual members of the audience for what individual politicians said. <clears throat> I'm sorry if you were uh, offended. Um, I mean. I, I There's an it's, apology. I think it's, yeah. I think it's a, no, no, because I really don't like these non-apology apologies. If you were offended, you clearly were offended. It wasn't my choice of language, but I really think there's very much more important think, things to be offended okay, about. Just a second, Alex. Let me hear from the man in the blue shirt with the glasses. There. Yes, on you go. I found I found the first minister's um, comments very negative. I can understand why people found them. Some people found them offensive, but I found them very negative, and I think what. People in Scotland and all over the UK, what they're looking for is some positivity, some vision as to where individual parties want to take Scotland. And we don't get any of that at the moment. Oh, but we and that's do. so disappointing. Lots of parties. Can I can I can different vision. Hang on a second, answer. Do you want to come in? That way? I mean, I think this is a symptom actually of our, lo our politics over the last decade, if we're being honest about it, where we have. Ha we have driven down into really divisive language, where we have used terms like traitors. Where in, as I say, in two referendums, people's loyalty was questioned. And I think the mood I'm getting from the audience, and I think is really, really right, is we're sick and tired of our politics being dragged into 
and us versus the first them. First Minister face used repeatedly in regards to class. myself and, and other one of the things that I've been really clear about, look, when you take over a political party that's at 14% in the opinion polls three years ago, uh, you very quickly realise that a politics of trying to pit community against community or Scott against Scott doesn't build together a support base to try and change our country. And I've been really, really clear, I don't care how anybody has voted in the past. I don't care how they voted in either of the two referendums. I actually don't care how they'd vote in any future referendum if we ever had one. But I know we all care about changing our country. Okay. I know we all care about fixing our NHS. I know we all care about getting our economy working for people across the country. And if we all care, let's respect each other and build right. a okay. programme right. that delivers change for all our right. country. Uh, Karen Dunbar, yep. yeah. does language matter? Well, I and no. <laughs> <laughs> And it's been really interesting listening to this. I mean, one way or another, whether, whether it was right or whether it was wrong, it's getting plenty of media traction, so it's worked, do you know? And it's been at a line where it's debatable rather than at the extremes that we've been talking about earlier. But some of the things that have been said here tonight, and it's not about necessarily refuting them, but have been said, people want civility or people want substance. Aye and no. Do you know, sometimes people want to watch a dog fight. <laughs> and, uh, and so it, we're living in a society now who, who, that seems to be whoever shouts the loudest gets the most attention. And if you can't shout loud enough, then shout something a bit extreme. And so that is what I feel is playing out in front of us, whether it is uh, and what you spoke about or whether it was uh, what's been said tonight as well. And so what's, what's new about that? And I think, see if we get civility for too long, we get bored. As, a, as the species that we are. Okay. No, as Scots or as, you know, a supporter of this party or that party, as we want everything Can, to explode I, I, so and then we want to... I, so I, don't, I, don't dis, I don't disagree with that. I do think, though, having had the kind of argument and political debate we've had for a decade in our country, I think people are getting tired of okay, it. And they would, they would take a period of stability and calm and Liz, voting, is that I think, rather than the chaos we've had. Period of stability and calm? So, I pull back the curtain a little bit. I've worked with political communications for a long time, right? It will take all parties deciding that they are not going to do this because they're not the only ones that do this. If you work in a party political press office, a journalist sees a tweet that's maybe a little bit poorly worded and will phone up, get the press officer and say, hey, do you want to give me an MP to be outraged about this today? MP will oblige and it's on the front page of the Daily Mail or the Telegraph or the Sun or whatever, and it kicks it all off. And you then aren't seeing the positive news, aren't seeing what your governments are actually doing for you, aren't hearing about the policies. You're getting the dogfight that Karen's talking about. So whose fault is that? And is it moving the country Who's forward? Who's responsible for that? I think that? it's a collective. I mean, like, it would actually take, and this is why I think it's very hard to step back from it, is it would take all politicians and all political parties to say, do you know what? We have lines. We're not doing this. And I think Karen's probably right. People do like a bit of an argument in politics, and they'd get a bit bored. Right, OK. Because a newscaster once tried to... Um, introduce a newspaper that only had good news in it. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> bought the paper because, and there's a lot of hypocrisy, we're all kind of guilty of this. We go out and buy newspapers that do a bit of shouting from their front pages, which is why the papers that do that yeah. are very successful. The Kumbaya newspapers are pretty few and far oh, between. Oh, well, maybe, maybe it needs to be an app. By the way, the uh, <laughs> Debate Night app is available for you to download. <laughs> uh, the podcast is, at least, anyway. Uh, your views on what we've just been talking about and everything else on the show, the hashtag is BBCDN. Uh, we're about to take our Easter break, but we're back four weeks tonight. We're going to be in Glasgow and the week after that, Aberdeen. So if you'd like to be in the audience for those shows, just go to the website, bbc.co.uk forward slash debate night. Let's go back to the questions. Question two tonight comes from Kirsty. Kirsty McGowan. Good evening, Kirsty. Good evening. What can be done to address the devaluing of our education system with increasing numbers of children now being absent from schools and mental health issues becoming larger and behaviours within the schools becoming increasingly challenging? Thanks, Kirsty. Uh, according to the latest Scottish Government figures, um, shockingly, about a third of pupils were persistently absent from school last year. Kirsty, you're a teacher. I think, aren't you? Yes. What are you seeing? What do you think? Um, I've been teaching for 31 years, so I see a lot of children who seem to be demotivated, disengaged with education just now, and I think that's been, it's been coming for a little while, but it's, it's definitely a much bigger issue in the last couple of years. Um, I think it's a bigger issue than the schools. I think it's a societal issue. And interestingly, I think it connects back to the last question, where there is a lack of respect across our society for people. We have a divisive people governing bodies, and that's the role models that our society see. And 
people do like a dog fight, but it gets taken to the extreme. And I think that's filtered right down to our education system where people don't see the point in that because they don't respect each other, they don't respect what the education can give them. Um, and I think that in schools, we're finding it particularly difficult at the moment to find a way to keep the children coming and, and rebuild what's maybe been broken. Thank you. Um, Anna Sarwa, 1996, I think it was, Tony Blair said, education, education, education. That was what he was all about. What are we going to do about increasing numbers of children absent from school a third on a regular basis and behavioural problems as well? I mean, the stats this week are absolutely heartbreaking. We're, you're right, we talked about a third of people in, uh, pupils in some areas being persistently absent. In some areas, it's as high as 50% persistently That's absent. That's being off more than 10% of their school time. Yeah, which is, which is a huge number. Um, almost 40% of pupils now require some kind of assisted support need. At the same time, the number of teachers has fallen, the number of ASN support workers in our schools has fallen. The resources in the classroom have also gone down so what we're because do of it? local government finance. Uh, well, we've got to address all these individual issues. We, we have got to, uh, one, recognise the connection to mental health uh, and the fact that we have such long waiting times around uh, CAMS services, some children waiting as long as two years to be seen. Uh, that needs urgent fixing. We need an urgent, I would suggest, a A&E uh, for mental health uh, as well. Not enough teachers feel safe in their classrooms, neither do enough pupils feel safe in the classroom. How do we have a zero tolerance approach to education? What does that actually mean in practice? Is that so, more exclusions? So people, look, I don't, I don't think it necessarily needs to be more exclusions, but I think it does need more additional support needs teachers in our classrooms. And I think if, if you speak to any teacher, if you have disruptive individuals in the classroom, it does not just disrupts for that individual pupil's education, it disrupts the ability of the teacher to teach the way they want to teach, and it disrupts every other pupil in that classroom as well. So having that additional support need, assisted support need, resource in the classroom is really important. That's fallen by a third uh, under this government. Uh, having more resources in the classroom, that means properly funding our local government, being a key part of that uh, as well. We can't ignore also the role that you, you mentioned, our wider politics and that corrosive, divisive nature. Social media and our mobile phones have also contributed massively to that negativity. Uh, children not feeling safe online, neither feeling safe in the classroom. Before, you had respite from a bully uh, when you went home, or if you were being bullied at home, you had respite at school from a bully. Now, with your mobile phone, that bully travels with you everywhere. And I think unless we can challenge the corrosive nature of social media, how we responsibly use our mobile phones, how we properly fund the resources in the classroom, how we empower teachers to be able to teach, how we get more additional support around our teachers and our classrooms, that is the only way we're going to address okay. what is a really, really serious We've issue got and failing far too many uh, pupils across parents the country. Parents and teachers in the audience tonight, man in the glasses. The beard, yes. I'm, I'm an additional support needs teacher, um, and you're funny you're talking about teacher numbers. Um, the teacher numbers are there. I'm a recently qualified teacher. I'm one of the lucky ones that has a permanent job. I have countless colleagues that are sitting in the house not working. The teachers yeah. are qualified. You've paid to train them as a government. Why are you not hiring them? Why are they sitting in the house after working really hard to train and qualify without a job? Thank you. Okay. Uh, and gentlemen there on the end, yeah. Um, I'm a high school student right now. And so like, I've seen firsthand, like my whole life, just this sort of almost deterioration of the education system. It's actually like terrible. So there's, um, for instance, the art department is, in my school is having to fundraise to get enough paper to get it through the year. Um, there's classrooms that are over, there's classes that are over the legal limit of students because there's simply not enough teachers or teaching areas to go around. Um, S6s. The sort of senior students are having to help out with the students with additional support needs because there's not enough additional support needs staff in the school. Like it's it's just completely crumbling. And I, I Mr. Sarwa, like it really like what you pointed out. It's like, like that's it. That's what it's like every day. There's just not enough. There's not enough funding. There's not enough teachers. Not enough support staff. There's not enough resources. There's, it's just falling apart. Let, let me ask you because you're there. A third of Scottish children regularly missing school. What do you think's going on? I, like, there, there, nobody's here. Like, I, I, I agree. Like, there's, my, my school's a bit of a special case. I think we're probably above the average of number of truancies and stuff. But, yeah, there's a lot of students. I mean, obviously, I'm an S6, so obviously people don't turn up all the time to S6. But, um, yeah, there's a lot of students missing school. And, yeah, 
I think it's because it's about this respect again. It's the fact that I think students have just lost this... I don't know how to describe it. It's like the S1s these days are definitely um, less engaged than probably I was in S1 and who knows why that is. OK, yeah. well, the pandemic's obviously been a, yeah. a change in recent years. Oliver Mundell, you were yeah, education no. spokesperson for the Scottish Conservatives. What's going on and what needs to be well, done about it? I was going to mention the pandemic first because to me that's one of the saddest things that sits behind the kind of headline figure. Some children haven't been back to school since COVID. You know, there are children living in Scotland who, for a variety of reasons, haven't been able to walk uh, through the school gates and into the building. Um, and I think we, ha we have to, to do something uh, to address that as well. And I think one of the challenges, you know, I look back, uh, you know, to, to being in school myself, there was a home link worker, uh, you know, there were people who specifically worked on this within local authorities. In a lot of areas of Scotland, those people are gone, uh, you know, and it's been, uh, you know, like everything else in society, kind of dumped on teachers uh, to, 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 to deal with it. You know, they're trying to teach a class, got lots going on, but no, no one's really following up, you know, or doing the hard work to get these young people uh, back into school um, and you know it, it's clear there's, there's a real problem wider than that you know I think there are huge challenges across uh, education I think we've made some big mistakes uh, in Scotland in terms of changing our, our curriculum uh, we've uh, we've got that we've got that wrong uh, you know and we've gone down a path of borrowing policies from other parts of the world when we had a good uh, education system uh, we've allowed discipline uh, to slip uh, you know and in some you know some parts uh, of the country, te you know, teachers are advised against uh, confronting uh, what is unacceptable behaviour uh, and told that they, they, they need to, to focus on uh, restorative conversations uh, and, you know, trying to help people understand how to behave differently. And as we've heard, that's disrupting learning for the whole class. OK, all right. Uh, all right. And I, I just think the current... I'd just say, I think the current uh, government, you know, haven't really got a grip on this. All right, you made, you uh, made that it's, clear. It, it's, let, it, it's disappointing. Let me hear from the audience. My and then maybe Paul Yeah, on you go. Yeah, I think, I mean, Scottish education was once revered worldwide. And there's no doubt under the SNP, they've absolutely destroyed every aspect of the Scottish education system. We're now right down the rankings at everything. Um, I can't think it's something they can't actually shy away from. Scottish education now is at the poorest level it's ever been in every aspect, through schools, through universities. It is an absolute shambles under the SNP. Thank absolute you. shambles. Thank you. A gentleman with the beard and the mustard top there. Yes. I definitely agree with Anna at this point around CAMS. So my son uh, has now been diagnosed with a learning disability and ADHD for which he's medicated for. However, it took two and a half years to get to that point. And sadly, I would never like to use the private health service because I believe in the NHS and I think the NHS should be free at the point of need. However, I got to the point where I had to go through um, getting diagnosed privately uh, through Bupa. And with that, it resulted in having no child psychiatry in Scotland. I actually had to go to Newcastle with my son to get diagnosed. Um, and I do think that around ESN, after COVID, there was a lot of support that got put in place, although it was a postcode lottery with what schools did with funding post-COVID. So luckily, my son's school did put additional support um, into the school. However, that funding was cut. So I definitely think CAMS and ASN is, is a massive uh, has issue. Has your boy been missing school because of the challenges that he's facing, or is he one of the, that, that third that's been missing? He, he is back now um, in school post-COVID. Um, however, I think there is a really high percentage of children in classes that have ASN needs, as much as a third of children in some classes have ASN or some form of additional needs. So if you think about it being a teacher, to a friend to the left here, um, you could have 30 children in a class. A teacher can't deal with that themselves. So right. I definitely think there's a lot more that needs done. OK, thank you. Karen Dunbar. Uh, it's heartbreaking listening to this. Uh, and it's no surprise, though, and that makes it even more heartbreaking. Uh, I mean, uh, listening to that woman there, it's the teacher and the teachers uh, are struggling with the kids and the kids are struggling with the teachers and the parents are struggling with both. And it's just like, it's nobody's fault. So w w where's the solution in it? Sometimes I, I like to try and remind myself that schools weren't really set up for the, the benefit of Wains. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they were. I think they were there to largely churn out wee drones for the factories. Is that not what schools started off as? If I remember rightly, in the Industrial Revolution. Depends which school <coughs> you went to. Well, probably the one I went to was definitely ch uh, churning out drones. Um, but how do we benefit? I mean, you're talking there about uh, kids being on waiting lists for cams. By the time they're getting seen, it's age concern that's seeing them. Do you know? Yeah. So how are we taking care of it? 
that she spoke about as well, mobile phones. I don't know how teachers manage to cope with that, but we take mobile phones off Wayne's and they can't cope with no having mobile phones. Mm. No wonder the parents are putting them out because it takes so much to take the Wayne to school now. And parents are, are done in as well. So there's a, just this perpetual motion of one blaming the other, blaming the other, blaming the other. And it doesn't seem like there's any way out here other than... Um, I well, I don't even I think know it's more, where to start with I think it. It's, more it's a mental health crisis more, for all parties. I think it's, it's more support for families. Uh, you know, more support within, within school. There are easy things you know, that, that could be looked at. Now, we've got a situation in Scotland in terms of, of ASN you know, where we've effectively despecialised our workload. There are schools of, in, in, in council areas that are run by all parties across Scotland that do not know how much additional support they can put into individual primary schools next year, who ration hours, uh, who use computer matrices to work out how much time people deserve. They have schools bidding in to say, we need this many hours for the young people we have. Uh, and then uh, the council come back and say, well, we don't have the people to provide that. And th th that's, that's wrong. We've said, you know, practically every politician you have said education is a priority. Well, well, yet we're not able to deliver. Okay, so we're not able to deliver. N Nicola Sturgeon said, "Judge me on education, Liz Lloyd, when you were yeah. our chief of staff. What's gone wrong?" Um, I feel like you've invited me on to answer for that rather than anything else. Um, no, I think so. I actually disagree with the point that saying you know absolutely everything's gone wrong. That's not true. But there are clear challenges. There are absolutely clear challenges. A lot of which can be pinpointed to the pandemic. And some the of the problems were there well, before that, Liz. Second, Oliver, the problems were there. Chance. Things have been going downhill yeah, for a long hold on time. Just one second. Thank you. Um, there have been attempts to reform Scottish education. There have been attempts to improve Scottish education. There have been attempts to empower schools, to put more money in the hands of schools to choose what they spend it on. That has, and I think this is you know, broadly accepted, not gone as well as it should do and not delivered the results that the SNP hoped it would deliver. That said, you know, we talked about universities sort of saying, you know, they're failing to. Actually, it's one of Scotland's universities that is the best ranked in the UK. They're some of the best ranked in Europe. But the system has not successfully managed to transition, not all of our children, but some of them through school and out the other end. I think there's a huge potential in a lot of Scotland's young people, some young people doing brilliant things. But there is a risk that we're leaving some behind. Some of that is to do with poverty. And the Scottish Government and the SNP can do what it can in that regard. It's provided more funding, provided more resource, provided more funding to schools with large numbers of children in poverty. There is a broader issue, which is that if children are in houses where they can't afford to eat, where they can't afford to heat, they are not going to school ready to learn. And that is not just on the Scottish Government, that is a UK-wide issue. There is a general issue as well, you're talking about funding and how much there is. There is the fact that for 15, 16 years, the UK as a whole has been living under austerity. And that has cut the amount of funding that is available. Now, there are choices governments can make about where that funding goes. And I'm sure if you're a teacher, you argue that more of that should be in schools. There is then, I think, for me, a bit of an issue about what we're expecting and how we expect young people and society, teachers, parents, families, to interact and how difficult that is for young people right now. I would hate to be a teenager right now. Like, it just does not look as, like it's as much fun as being a teenager should be. And part of that is maybe screens. Part of that is the years of the pandemic where you should have been out with your friends and you weren't, you were isolated. And I think that combination has made it particularly hard, and these figures show that, for young people to come back into school and engage properly in their education with teachers, with their peers, not to be bullied, not to be anxious, and to be able to have the clear head to sit down and learn. Sort of Kate Forbes has said this is going to have a, an economic impact in Scotland unless we get this sorted. Let me hear from more people in the audience. Uh, lady with the red hair there, yes. On you go. This is not just a high school issue, as he mentioned. This is in universities. I'm in my third year. My first and second year were disrupted like you've never seen. I, my entire first year was online. I didn't go to any in-person classes. I never met my lecturers once. It was all on a screen. My second year, classes finished in April. We were supposed to get our grades back in May. I didn't know if I was going to be sitting my third year classes until August mm. because we didn't get results back until then. <coughs> it, like Universities are a mess. They don't have the help they need. Even this past semester, I've had six 
teachers for one class. It's unorganized and it doesn't seem like any help is being given to universities because of this. It's not the education that you expected to be getting? No. It's not the education that I'm paying money to get. Like, r rents for university are extortionate. For 17-week rental in a tiny shoebox of a room, I'm paying over two grand. And that's me as a 20-year-old. I'm Two grand for rent for 17 <coughs> weeks for an education that I'm, does not live up to the standards that I'm paying the money for. OK, thank you, thank you for sharing that with us. Lady in the green dress up there, yes. Hi. Um, I'm a speech and language therapist um, working in the field of additional support needs. Um, there's a huge presumption of mainstream in our Scottish education system, which I personally believe doesn't always work for everybody. Um, I see families at crisis day in, day out. Um, some, many of the families who as ch children are in mainstream education um, are not getting the support that they've been promised, whether that's one-to-one -one support or um, equipment. Um, some are having to go to tribunal and fight for their, their children to, to get specialist provision. Um, what I'm mainly concerned about is the waiting times for CAMS and for children really to get support before it gets to a crisis point. Mm -hmm. I've seen children breaking, broken. And for me, it makes me so sad. I want to see children who can access CAMS. I know CAMS are outsour outsourcing to Helios and various you know, agencies, um, but it's not quick enough. And I want to see the children in Scotland getting the support they absolutely deserve mm. at, at a point where they're not broken. OK, we, 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 I'll come back in just a second. We, we talk a lot about child mental health in Scotland for that reason. Just la finally, gentlemen on the end of the row in the black jacket. Yeah, on you go. If you're talking about a third of the children, the children that you're talking about, I worked in youth justice for 11 years. And the kids that I worked with were all kids who were on limited timetables. They weren't at school on a, a normal timetable, but the school didn't have anything in place for these young people. So unless you do that first, you need to have something that they come into school to do. Mm -hmm. Bricky, joiner, anything that they're going to advocate, they're not going to be in university. They're not going to be in office jobs because they're no good with numbers or they're no good with words. So you need to have the joiners, the sparkies, the, the, the jobs that we can't get just now, they should be coming in and teaching kids who's on a two-day timetable in school at 14. Two days a week he's at school. Could he not be working with a building firm or something? Something that he's actually going to do that's going to benefit him. OK, thank you. We're coming round to exam time again. John Nicholson, what are we going to do about this? Well, I'd like to, I'd like to inject a bit of optimism <laughs> before we finish the answer. But to go back to the original questioner, uh, clearly there's a relationship, isn't there, between poverty and performance. And that's why the austerity we've suffered is deeply concerning and I worry when I hear some of my friends in the Labour Party talking about an ongoing austerity agenda because we need major investment when the Labour Party comes in it has to be very different from the Thatcherite agenda which one of their uh, leaders was praising recently but uh, but you're talk responsible to the young for education. Let me talk you're to responsible the young, for education let me talk to the young on those points let me talk to the young gentleman for a second you're at the most magical age. Uh, I mean, Liz said she wouldn't want to go back and be a teenager again. I would love to go back mm -hmm. and be a teenager again. What a wonderful want to be one uh, moment <laughs> it is in your life with the whole world ahead of you. So don't be gloomy, be optimistic. Scotland has a wonderful university education sector. We've got the highest percentage, I think, of tertiary education in all of, all of Europe. And I was the first generation of my family to go to university and it transformed and changed my life. If you live south of the border, you rack up huge amounts of debt on university fees, and universities are free in Scotland of tuition fees. That is a very, very wonderful thing. Now, the two of us went to the, the same uh, school. I, I used Not the to, same I time, John. Up to him. He was a great mentor. <laughs> Uh, to, <laughs> to me, and uh, but before we all get a little bit too romantic about this, there was 40 kids in our classes, 40 kids. 
So the idea that the old days of Scottish education were all magical with tiny, uh, tiny yeah. classrooms but we and well John, 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 we now have a isn't, third of children this, regularly missing school. That's the challenge right now. Exactly. And the, the, the lady who introduced that right at the beginning, I thought, made an absolutely essential point, which you talked about, the, 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 the violence in the classroom, violence against teachers in the classroom, and, and hunger in classrooms. And I'm yeah. so glad we've done what we've done on giving children free school meals universally Correct. in their Absolutely. early years because hunger is, is a disgrace in contemporary society. The idea that children are going to school hungry should shame all of us as a society, and I'm glad we're addressing it. Okay, okay. Uh, the hashtag is BBCDN for your views on all of this. There's more we want to get through this evening. Let's go to our third question of the night, which comes from Jenny Rogers. Jenny, evening. Hi, evening. The Hate Crime and Public Order Scotland Act comes into force in less than a fortnight. Police Scotland have pledged to investigate every reported hate crime that comes to their desk, even if it comes from a comedian and their act on stage. Have we gone too far? Thank you, Jenny. Uh, yeah, this new legislation starts 1st of April. Um, it will mean there's a public information campaign, you might have seen about this already, criminalising, threatening or abusive behaviour intended to stir up hatred against certain characteristics. Karen Dunbar, you're out on tour. <laughs> next month. Aye. Are you worried about this? Um, I, I don't think so. And that's partly because maybe of my brand of comedy. Mine's is a lot of my own stories about the past and things like that. So there's not a lot of dodgy stuff, really, that's involved in it. But what is dodgy stuff now? That seems to be moving all the time. The goalposts seem to be moving all the time in that. And I think uh, there's levels of police and language that really strike a, a level of fear into me about where we actually go as a society. And we, we spoke about that earlier with, um, you know, make history by um, having a Tory free Scotland and that now becoming something that's contentious to say. So I'll be interested to see, because I think the specific thing that's, uh, th that's happening in it is if it stirs up hatred and it's what actually denotes stirring up hatred. So I don't think it's as inflammatory as it's actually being made out to be, that you can't say anything any more without the fear of getting arrested. But there is still, there's a, a, it, takes, it takes sometimes a bit of a sinister turn about what can, uh, can come out of somebody's mouth without them being locked up. That concerns me, because when you start policing language, then it feels like, We've got to go underground to speak about things that we want to speak about. And I'm not necessarily saying any isms. I'm just talking about, like, life in general. You know, see if you had a different idea for the, the narrative that was going on about COVID. Who were you talking to about that? You couldn't talk to anybody about that. It just was... You just had to go with the one thing. So, I mean, that's, that's opening up a real can of worms there. But it's just an example of, you know, that's no offending. That's no a, a hate crime or anything. Or is it? Would that be seen as that now, if you're not going along with... What the, the no. popular narrative is. John Nicholson, the Scottish Police Federation have voiced real concerns about this and what it's going to mean for the officers trying to police this. Do we need this legislation or has it gone too far? Well, of course, the Scottish uh, Police came out, the polis came out and said the story in the front page of the Herald was a, was a, was a load of uh, nonsense. Do you know, when you've been around journalism or politics for a while, there's recurring themes. And I'm picking up this is political correctness gone mad. <coughs> Remember we kept hearing that a few years ago? So this is now, we're hearing that all over again. So why do we need this you legislation you then? Well, because to, to, to pick up on the point about comedy, the kind of comedy that I like the best is comedy which punches up, doesn't punch down, which takes on power, makes fun and mocks the powerful, but doesn't mock or belittle people who are vulnerable. What this legislation does, and I'm no expert on the legislation, but my understanding of the legislation is it tries to protect uh, vulnerable groups from hate. And we know the groups that are attacked. We've seen it uh, this last week with Islamophobic comments, uh, racist comments. Uh, we see it all the time with transphobic comments, with trans people at the centre of this terrible outpouring of hate. And as a gay man, I used to hear the most awful language used routinely, which fortunately these days is lessened. But we have a right to protect people from hate and hate which stirs up hate. And it doesn't mean you can't talk freely and sensibly or be funny. Who decides what is hate? Mm. 
Well, I think we have to use a bit of common sense. We, we, we know when we hear hate, don't we? I mean, all of us know when we hear a hateful comment. We, we, we know instinctively that it is, it is wrong. That's why what we were so upset do you know by what, what was said is? to Diane Abbott. Do, do you understand it was that? Hateful. There have been things, as a gay woman, there have been things that have been said to me that have been very detrimental, and some of them recently, by the way, which is a surprise, because I haven't experienced homophobia for a long time, but see, in the past six months, I'm hearing it creeping back in. And would you report that as a hate crime? It crossed my mind for one of the specific things that happened, but I went against it. And the reason that I went against it was I didn't want, the, I didn't want that publicity. So get your heads around that one. I didn't want to have to, you know, Camden Bar, blah, 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 in case anything g g gathered with that. And then there was a pile on for and against. So that is a dangerous thing that I could find myself moving into the background with that and saying, just let it go. Mm -hmm. So I do agree with you, John, there'll be a lot of minority groups that are doing that, like, just let it go, and that does need to be protected. But there is also what you said there, Stephen, about what denotes hate now seems to be that way. You know, if you don't like somebody's shoes, you're going to get jailed for it. Well, let's find out if the audience feel more protected I like because them, of this. By the way. Gentlemen <laughs> in the check shirt in the middle. Yeah, on you go. Uh, as a point on it, every weekend during the football season, it's there's hatred every weekend. What what's going to be done about that? There is but racist, there's who? homophobic comments, that there's mostly a rise in sectarian comments. Mm. Every weekend, it's certain teams. We know it happens. We hear it on the television. We hear it in the stands. Nothing gets done about it. The Scottish Football Authorities don't do anything about it. The police aren't doing anything about it. Who's going to do something about it? Thank you. Uh, Liz Lloyd, uh, we've been down that road with, with football and trying <coughs> to l limit hate in football as well, and that didn't work out terribly well. So is this legislation going to end up in the same place, do you think, with that? No, I don't think so. Um, uh, that legislation was introduced by the previous SNP government, which was Alex Hammond, and um, I think, you know... That and failed. And, and failed. failed, and that legislation had its flaws. I think what we have here in this hate crime bill, there was a piece of work done by a very senior judge, Lord Brackadale, to look at the nature of hate crime legislation in Scotland and whether it was doing the job. And it's not just, you hate, what do we have, my shoes, so, you know, you, I report that's a hate crime. It's not that. This is about Islamophobia. It's about homophobia. It's about attacking people with disabilities. It's about people with key characteristics, minority groups in our country, who face abuse, or who face crimes committed against them because of their race or religion or their sexuality. Women, women not included in that, though. Women are going to have a separate bill, and I'm very supportive of this, because this bill deals with minority groups. It deals with hatred committed against minority groups. Women are a majority mm. in society, but yet we suffer misogyny constantly. The hatred against women is not... It doesn't sort of expose itself in the same way because it's just low level. It's there all the time. So there was a very serious piece of, again, a proper serious piece of work done. Baroness Helena Kennedy, eminent Casey, was asked to go away and decide should offences against women be in this bill or should there be a separate bill of offences, misogynistic hate. And as far as I understand it, the government's currently consulting We're on that and it should that. be introduced next year. But... You know, we have a rise in Islamophobia, we have a rise in anti-Semitism going on in our society. It feels a bit ridiculous to me that we have that backdrop and yet we have politicians, some, saying, let's delay this, let's push it back. Um, you know, we need to take action when it's there. If we just keep saying, oh, we'll do it, we'll do it, we'll do it. You've got this rise in homophobia that Karen's talking about. When do we say enough? OK, all right, let me hear from the audience. A gentleman in the grey, top there. Um, I feel it's all good saying let's bring in the legislation now, let's do it now. But what we've seen, particularly with Police Scotland, is drastically reduced resources, they're struggling with staffing. So it's all good on the headline saying, oh, we're going to deal with it. But then if you've not got the resources, the staff there to do it, all it is is a headline to say, look what we've done. It's not actually going to be dealt with because they've not got the resources to deal with it. So it's, it's just a headline. That's and all so, it is. I think you and voted the, for this. Yes. Uh, how are Police Scotland going to enforce it? So, first of all, just touching on the point that the gentleman just made there, is you're absolutely right. Tomorrow at the Scottish Police Authority, there is a paper going to the SPA saying that the pilot done in Aberdeen where some crimes will not be investigated anymore should be rolled out across the country that includes robberies, burglaries, some assaults. 
And if we're saying we're not going to investigate those crimes whilst adding even more legislation on top, we aren't recognising the real stress and strains we're putting on our police service. It. And I stand by stand voting for it. The point I'm making is, if we're, not, if we're not going to properly resource and train our police officers, and even the most basic crimes like burglary aren't going to be investigated, I can understand why people don't have confidence that this new law will give them the protections that they need. And actually, just touching upon that point, I actually think all three questions we've had today are connected. If you think about the broader question around language in our politics mm. and how that pulls people apart, if you talk about the mental health impact on young people eh, and the impact that has on their education and their life opportunities, if you talk about hate crime legislation, all of it is connected. Uh, honestly, as someone that has a 15-year-old, a 13-year-old, eh, I honestly believe that we live in a more hate-filled world now than the one that I was growing up in. Hate crime is on the rise. Prejudice and hate in all its forms is on the rise. And how do we address it? Part of it is our legislation around our justice system, but actually the much more significant part is actually education. It's how are we teaching people to coexist, to respect, to learn from each other, and actually to have an equal stake in seeing success for every individual communities. And I just feel right now where we're squeezing resources, we're not properly seeing those services in place, that we end up in these arguments and debates around divisive issues rather than actually outcomes. What are the outcomes in our country? The outcomes in our country is mental health issues are on the rise, young people aren't getting opportunity, hate crimes on the rise, and we're investigating less crimes. Unless we address those four outcomes and have a positive answer to all four, this has continued to spiral and get worse okay. and worse for people. All of them, Mandel, we all want to see a less hateful Scotland. Is this the way to do it? Uh, no, it's uh, not, because I don't think it tackles uh, the underlying causes. Um, and I think you know, it's, it's not just some politicians who've got concerns about the bill. We've heard uh, from yourself, Stephen, and uh, the gentleman in the audience, the, the, the many police officers and the police federation have concerns about how it's actually going to be enforced and john talked before about common sense uh, but the law has to be clear it has to be specific and it has to be enforceable uh, and i have serious reservations uh, about you know who exactly is going to decide uh, where the where the thresholds are there are some easy cases uh, where you can definitely call things out as hateful but there are a lot of things in, in gray areas and this legislation uh, doesn't uh, it doesn't provide that certainty uh, and I think it does start to impinge on, on freedom of speech and I agree with Anas you know, I actually think the answer to much of this is, is in education it is in changing societal attitudes I think too often we heard about headline grabbing too often the Scottish Parliament over the last 17 years particularly uh, has been about you know various first ministers uh, announcing various things in Holyrood and thinking because we pass a new law uh, or uh, we, we, we say we're going to be tough on something or we're going to get it fixed, uh, that that actually solves the problem. Uh, and all it, all it does, uh, all it, all it does is, is make people more and more disillusioned about politics. Okay. You know, we, right. need to, we need to actually get to the bottom of these issues okay. and, and, and do something okay. about okay. it. Okay, uh, the hashtag is BBCDN. Your views from that at home. I want to squeeze in one final question tonight, uh, which comes from Jim Prentice. Jim, good evening. Evening, panel. Why are Scottish drug death figures higher than England and Wales, and many times higher than Europe. Thank you. Uh, we have by far the highest drug death total uh, paired to the population still in Europe. We're tight on time, but it's such an important subject. I want to do this this evening as our final question. Um, Liz Lloyd, the SNP said it had a national mission mm -hmm. to tackle drug deaths in Scotland. Why is it failing? I think it's too early to say it's failing, and that's a hard thing to say when people are dying. Um, but when you're trying to turn around something, and there is an acceptance that you know, mistakes have been made in this policy, but when you're trying to turn around something, the results don't come in one year or two, particularly when you're dealing with issues like addiction. You, know, you have to put in the investment, you have to build the resources, you have to support people to transform their lives, to come off drugs, to not fall into the drugs trap again. And that takes time. I think some of these issues, we're very quick to say, we judge you on the outcomes in year one. Actually, some of this, we need to judge the outcomes over a longer term. That national mission is a couple of years old. Um, so what we're talking about, a decade? I think you probably, I think it's sort of done in, I guess, kind of like five-year chunks. There's a commitment to, you know, massively increase the number of rehab beds. And that's, I think, got a deadline of 25, 26. So look at that point. But you're trying to turn around a generation's issue 
You don't do that overnight. OK, well, uh, we are tight in time on this. Anna Sauer, you could be First Minister in two years' time. How are you going to do things differently? So, so first of all, it's really important to stress that, as the question said, we have the exact same drugs laws as, er, er, laws as everybody else in the UK, but we have almost three numbers, the, three times the number of drugs deaths. And what I don't, and thank we've not done it so far today, but for far too often we look to blame somebody else. We're going to take responsibility for a change. Government that's got responsibility, fully devolved responsibility, has got to do something about it. The answer is proper su support for alcohol and drug partnerships which has funding has been brutally cut over the last 17 years. We do need more rehab beds. We've been promised hundreds of more rehab beds. We have 32 more rehab beds. We need much more than that. Certain services, for example, a service in Glasgow for particularly women with addiction issues have seen their funding withdrawn altogether. That's not uh, appropriate. We've got to recognise the link between, I think, uh, drugs deaths, our suicide rates, our addiction rates around alcohol. We uh, talked about other issues uh, before. We've also recognised a connection to, to poverty and also, I think, a recognition uh, that family breakdown and relationship Could you make a difference quickly, is, more quickly, do you think? Uh, I think yes, uh, in terms of uh, that investment in those rehab beds and a focus in terms of, for example, the, the drug testing units that were promised that haven't been uh, yeah. brought on okay. stream. Look, those things can happen we're immediately. Tight in time. I need those to things move can on. happen immediately. John Nicholson. Um, it's a tragedy. I uh, spent time last weekend with two different uh, drug charities in my constituency and I was asking them specifically what message they wanted to give to politicians and because I believe that you should listen to the experts. And they said, well, one thing they highlighted that they thought was very important was safe consumption rooms. They thought that was enormously important. One of my parliamentary colleagues talked very movingly about his brother dying out with a safe consumption room. Penny Morton, who wants to be the Tory leader, attacked safe consumption rooms and said it made it too nice well, for we, people we to take drugs. We know there are coming mm -hmm. in, in Glasgow. We're and really, really, we're really think, strong. I really think we're really, really strong strong important. Yeah. Okay, I, poverty. Okay. Poverty is key and, and an end to austerity All right, okay. Oliver Mundell, key. what needs to be done? Well, I think the frustrating thing for me is hearing someone who worked so closely with Nicola Sturgeon for so long sitting here saying... You know, we expect things to get better in the future because we're not in year one. You know, this is something that's been around for a long time. It's been a growing issue. Uh, and we've had voices uh, from uh, the third sector, voices from the uh, recovery community. Uh, we've had voices so we need, we need to get moving call, calling for rehab. Okay. We have rehab beds in this country uh, that, are, that are, are, are kind of used by foreign nationals okay, okay. Uh, that could have been used Canada, through all of this final time word for you on this. What do we need to do? We are fastly forgetting how to take care of each other. It doesn't matter what party we're from, just as people. How to look after each other, how to take folk into our homes, how to nurture them. And also, we're talking about sending people out for rehabs. To what? You know, back to the, the nothingness that they came for. People are scared. People are looking for a way to self-soothe. And then we're taking that away from them and no replacing it with much either. That's what the problem is. Karen, we're out of time. Thank you very much indeed to our panel here tonight and to you. That's it for this evening. We're back after Easter. Four weeks tonight, we'll be in Glasgow. Then we'll be in Aberdeen after that. Keep an eye on the website. For details of future locations as we travel around Scotland, if you missed any of tonight's show, we're repeated a bit later on BBC One Scotland or you can watch it any time on the BBC iPlayer. Thank you to the panel here tonight and to our audience here in Stirling. And to you, wherever you are in Scotland for watching, we'll see you after Easter. In the meantime, stay safe, stay well. From all of us in Debate Night, good night.